Thank you all for joining us. Thank you for uh, having me. It's always a challenge to be right after lunch. So guys, please do not put anybody to sleep. It's going to be on you guys if you do. I'm joined by uh, Jimmy Spivey. He's uh, Chief of Mission Systems at Johnson Space Center for NASA. Brian Chemansky is former Director of Integrated Intelligence uh, System Office at NRO. And Josh Perry is at the end Senior Vice President Space Intelligence Business for Booz Allen. So let's start, Jimmy, with you. Tell us about how AI is being used uh, at your work at NASA and uh, specifically with the ground systems. And what are the areas you're looking at in the future? So today, we, um, I would say we deploy some um, early level AI in, in the monitoring of, of space systems. Historically, it's been a flight controller and an astronaut who have been trained, uh, mostly that the, uh, the monitoring of the systems uh, came to the flight controller in the Mission Control Center in Houston. And that person was trained in their systems expertise and they monitored systems for, for problems and failure as they also too monitored you know, where they are in the mission. The astronauts responded to a lot of, of incidents that we've had over the number of years because they were had hands on to the spacecraft. That's evolved over a number of years. And you know, the last uh, 25 plus years, we've been flying the International Space Station. And as we progress through that continuous having humans in space, we've used certain systems to monitor um, the, uh, the performance of the spacecraft. We've leak detection for fluid systems and things like that. But for, in some cases, we've even used it to predict, as the previous panel talked about, to predict some things. Early on in space station, we had some issues with uh, our antennas requiring certain communication satellites. And so we used, uh, again, what I would say, uh, an early version of AI uh, once we realized at what part of the mission, what times of the year, because it affected the the angle and and of the uh, antenna selection on on the satellites, we used that we gathered a lot of data and put that into into software systems that then could be predictive and say, hey, this time of the year, this orbit, this uh, situation or this attitude of the space station, these are the times when you're going to see failures. And then our our mission planning team could actually put that into the timeline. And they could do that as far as a year in advance, which really helped us with, with a lot of our mission planning. And Brian, to you now on uh, your experience in the IC <clears throat> and your thoughts regarding both generative AI, large language models, and the shift to a more automated collection management and tasking. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, my experience in the IC, I joined the NRO um, after some time in the Marine Corps uh, I was born in Huntsville, Alabama, so I was always fascinated with space, and I really joined the NRO just to get into space, and I worked on a lot of space systems. Um, after about 15 years in the NRO, I went over to work CIA, and I was pulled back to the NRO uh, with something called the commercial geo and activity, where we started evaluating uh, commercial startups, the space startups in new space, and how can we apply these uh, new space assets toward um, uh, NRO problems. Uh, it, it became aware to me at that time that space was really becoming a commodity, the space segment, and the magic was on the ground. Uh, so I had an opportunity to go over to the I2SPO where we're starting to automate a lot of the processes, sense making and, and uh, collection management activities uh, there. Um, at the time I retired, maybe a little over a year and a half ago, it was just before ChatGPT made its big splash. Um, we we're still doing a lot of heuristic models. So the heuristic models, being uh, an analyst would uh, uh, tell us these are the types of activities we see we see before an event. Uh, once we see those activities, then we'll um, task accordingly. Um, the, the problem with these models, uh, although they're great in automation and uh, of the process, was they're limited because you needed the analyst to uh, predict uh, what was going to go happen. Uh, so there's a lot of um, very touch labor, uh, analyst intensive. Uh, processes. Once ChatGPT um, made a splash, I thought, hey, right, this is something we could probably use uh, to help collection management. The problem that I see, though, even though it's great promise, is the training of the ChatGPT models. You need to bring it into the IC. You need to train it on its lexicon and vernacular, which is different. And you also need to train it based on years of experience. These are the drivers that drove collection. These are the collection decisions that were being made. And most importantly, 
most importantly, I think that was me. I was about to go on camera, so I understand feedback. <laughs> <laughs> most importantly, you need to know what the impact of that question was. Um, and, and having all that information together, I'm not sure exists. That, that's going to make it difficult to adopt these tools. Um, uh, and I think that the biggest thing was really uh, what was the impact? Did the collection have the desired impact? And, and when you take the image, what, when you look at past performance, you really have one data point. You don't really know what the alternatives were to that particular piece of a collection. Um, and then once we train the models, uh, it, so suppose we use the last 20 years, the last 20 years have been spent on um, counterterrorism with a particular constellation. And it's that model that we train based on uh, the historic information going to be representative of what we're going to see moving forward when the collection architecture is going to change and our focus has pivoted away from uh, counterterrorism to Indo-PACOM. Um, so Josh, what do you do about that situation? I mean, the, obviously, when you train AI, it's going to be historical data. So how do you get it to predict what could happen in the future? Is, isn't that impossible? I mean, it's definitely difficult. I mean, and I think it goes back to kind of basics where, you know, getting access to the data, making your systems open and enabling uh, the, uh, the, the insertion of those kinds of uh, algorithms and uh, machine learning models and stuff into your systems. There's still a lot of work to be done on just those kind of bare basics to get the system ready to handle those. So in some cases where you don't have the perfect data set yet, or you're going to be collecting that data, just kind of instrumenting and designing and architecting your systems to allow that future flexibility is really, really important. And, and that's what we found is that, you know, looking at how do we design these fully open systems that are modular, that allow you um, to, to insert technology and capabilities that you might not predict. I think, you know, ground systems have a history of being kind of exquisitely designed, uh, you know, uh, long lead uh, kind of monolithic systems that do one thing really, really well designed for their particular constellation. And we need to really, um, you know, we use a phrase sometimes perforate the stove pipes uh, to get that data out of those systems and make it uh, available so that you can do the analysis on it. You can, like I said, plug it into algorithms. You can uh, really make it interoperable more quickly than trying to, like, kind of um, over architect a bunch of uh, ICDs up front, uh, knowing like where the system interfaces are going to be. Well, speaking of design, you wrote a blog post, and the title was, Why are space system experts designing ground systems? So how should ground systems be designed? So, I mean, yeah, that was a little tongue-in-cheek with the idea of trying to point out, like, a lot of times, also historically, we have, um, you know, these really brilliant, you know, we've talked to a bunch of them today, and we'll see more, you know, space engineers, people who are experts in either the sensor phenomenology or orbit mechanics, and they design these amazing spacecraft, and they're like, oh, yeah, we need to build a ground system afterwards, I guess, to control this and to get the data out of it. And, um, but really, if you look at, you know, the way software has evolved really rapidly over the last definitely decade, um, you know, there's just so many differences and changes in how we do things that really you need software engineers who are focused on um, that skill set and that capability to be designing and building your, uh, your ground systems because there's, there's these new paradigms with DevSecOps and open architectures and, and just so many different techniques that, you can't expect people whose job it is to be really, really great at space to understand exactly how to build those. And you need to have those ground system software focused people being the ones designing that and bringing those capabilities into those uh, ground systems, designing them for that future capability. Because as we talked about, I think on one of the earlier panels also, you know, you, uh, I think it was uh, Colonel Harvey <laughs> talked about this, you, this design, the, the, the uh, mindset of, okay, I have to make this perfect because I'm not going to be able to go up in space very easily and manipulate it is different in software, right? So we got to fail fast, move quickly, design it. But you also have to design it with flexibility in mind because you're not going to be able to change that sensor or that, um, uh, that platform in space very easily. You're going to need to make all the mission changes that are going to need to come on the ground. We're, we're going to uh, delve into that a little bit more. But uh, Jimmy, when, when considering uh, modernization and going to that next level, you've said, quote, silicon is cheap and carbon is expensive. What do you mean by that? Well, in my world, cost drives a lot of things. Uh, and usually my experience has been it's the, the people that we have to not really design and deploy the systems, but then to maintain the systems is very expensive. And so uh, an automated system that actually helps you maintain the existing system that you have is really, I think, a goal that we have to go forth in the future. So it, anytime you 
we have a complex system, like for instance, the, the mission systems and the mission control center, it's, it's continually monitoring, you know, an onboard spacecraft uh, with anywhere from nowadays, now uh, six to the 10 astronauts uh, on board. And we want to make sure that the, they're safe, the spacecraft is safe, and we execute the mission. And the, the number of people it requires, the carbon it requires to make sure those systems are up to date and are, are maintenance properly. We do software updates sometimes weekly for the multiple systems that we have. That all takes people. So a system that can really automate that, that maintenance of, of your uh, sustaining engineering, like we like to call it, is really something that we need to move to in the future. Josh, back to you. You mentioned DevSecOps, other open um, software development frameworks. How does that work when you're um, when you're dealing with this the, the tension between the old systems and the new systems? Yeah, no, it's a great great question. It's a it's a big challenge because you know the the infrastructure for these um, space systems, especially in in um, the defense and the IC, a lot of them are are pretty mature, I guess would be a nice way to say it. Um, and so you have different parts um, in place and some of them inside them have really great business logic and algorithms that have been thought through, but they're just not to the modern technology standard. And so what we've looked at doing is we stand up these um, software frameworks that have uh, that open architecture or DevSecOps enabled um, and a microservices approach so that we can sometimes take that legacy software as is and deploy it initially into those frameworks and, and kind of following uh, design patterns there, isolate that and modernize it in the future so we can kind of take on different pieces that we need to, um, uh, that we need to fix at different times depending on the mission. Um, that allows us to kind of get that investment quickly while also though, moving to that more open and uh, more maintainable architecture where we can you know, patch automatically and all those kinds of values of doing uh, stuff in the DevSecOps environment. Um, so that's one thing. The other is um, a lot of uh, data services around enabling interoperability. So we do a lot of translation of kind of legacy formats and legacy data into modern um, and common formats so that we can uh, act as bridges between different systems, whether the modernized or the legacy. And we have uh, really a 30 year history of doing the, that kind of uh, data translation in the IC uh, between ground systems so that you don't have to do these big bang enablements to have all your systems get upgraded at once, um, but you can uh, kind of do it piecemeal with uh, middleware in between uh, to enable uh, rolling updates. And what about hardware? So, um, yeah, no, that's, that's a challenge. I mean, and through the years, you know, we've been part of these migrations of taking things from, you know, deck alpha type open VMS systems all the way through to now in the cloud. Um, and, you know, historically it's been kind of massive rewrites or full redesigns as you do those steps um, to move to different hardware platforms. What's nice is we've gotten to now where the hardware is more commodity and using kind of container-based technologies like Kubernetes and Docker and stuff like that, we can, the things that we are mostly now building and designing to deploy in the cloud, we can flex that into either on-prem or edge solutions because that uh, hardware standard enables us to move across the different um, platforms on the ground. Brian, I want to ask you about using I, um, AI in space. So using AI to analyze data in orbit without having to bring it down to earth and then storing it and parsing it and doing all that in space. What, what are the possibilities there? Um, yeah, this is, this is one of those areas that always seems to be in question. Um, there's such a tremendous amount of processing power on the ground. And when you see the, uh, the improvements in uh, communications with stuff like Starlink, it just seems easy to bring the raw data down, process it, and then push the product back out to whoever needs it, wherever they are in the world. But I think there's some instances where when, when constellations of satellites need to work together, that you want to do some analysis up in orbit to retire the... Uh, retire the latency, uh, reduce the latency, and allow the satellite constellation to work better amongst each other. Um, <clears throat> I think there's some promise there. It's, it's still being worked, and I, I can point to SDA as a, uh, uh, as a um, driver of some of these requirements because they, they do everything unclassified. They're most recently um, SBIR, uh, I think uh, Task 7 or, or was talking about uh, a need um, for uh, battle space management, uh, command and control, uh, and communications, hardware and middleware to do certain types of processes. So they're already thinking about things to do in orbit. So right now, that the, uh, the the compute power that you can 
do in orbit uh, is, is limited. Um, what because they do when is, you think about image processing, that's even more data intense, isn't it? It is, yeah. So you're, you're limited by the number of models you can run. Uh, you're limited on the accuracy of those models. But in some cases, it might be good enough if you just want to point the next sensor uh, to an area of interest. So the types of things they want to do in orbit, um, AI, ML, images and signal processing, they want to do parallel processing, they want to do distributed processing. Uh, so these are all things I think they need to be enabled uh, in order to really do AI, ML in orbit uh, at the same time or, or effectively. And you also see some startups that are starting to do uh, space qualified uh, compute processing in orbit that are supposed to launch anywhere between uh, 24 and 25. Jimmy, turning to you, uh, you know, in talking about the, the vast quantities of, space, of uh, data coming from space, uh, storing it, parsing it, um, being able to have access to it, what are you thinking about in, in, those, um, in that case specifically about the, um, the amount of data and how to deal with it? Yeah, so I think it's, it's key. The, the data piece, for AI to work, it needs enormous amounts of data. And that data needs to be formatted and uh, it needs to be accessible. So any system you deploy that you want to use an AI tool for something, it's got to have all three of those. Uh, for us, the amount of data we, we bring down, we're limited based on the, the, uh, the speed of the, um, of, the, uh, of the systems that we have to bring it down and then the, then the storage. The storage of that data, I think, is really key for AI to work. Um, we talked a lot about cloud computing and, and cloud uh, data storage. I think the future of AI and, 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 and the cloud technology go hand in hand. Without the data, AI, is, is, it, it can't do its job. It, you know, we talk about it learning and, and, and enormous amounts of data, repetitive data, so it can learn. And then it can deploy certain things, make, do predictive things for you, do leak detection on critical spacecraft systems, maybe even systems uh, you know, think about a, a, a Mars mission where the, the time from COM is 30 minutes. The, in today's world, you know, flight controller in the mission control center can send a command to the space station, and it's there within three to four seconds. Now you're talking about 30 minutes for a command to get to a spacecraft, 30 minutes before you get end item response or say, hey, did it get there in the proper order? Did the computer take it on board? And so... A lot of that data needs to be resident on the computer and accessible so that AI could do its job if you used AI to monitor your spacecraft for, for long future. So I, I think it's the key that the data storage, the data location, and how you accept, uh, how those systems get to that data. And then it's got to understand the format. In my world, formatting data is huge because we have so many international partners, so many commercial partners, and everybody looks at data a little bit different. The translation of the data, so in a format, for, so it can go from one system to the next and is accessible, is key. And using a cloud technology for that data storage, again, I think is key for, for to make AI a, a really a, a applicable tool for human spaceflight of the future. Josh, your thoughts on that, and specifically how you go from one thing to the other. Do you have to get your cloud, get all your data in the cloud and all that done before you start thinking about AI? So, um, no, I mean, you, you should be thinking about it right away because I think to the point of the earlier panel, there needs to be the system engineering and the mission um, and problem decomposition, uh, decomposition to really think through what are you trying to solve with those techniques. But, um, but I do think that from a technology perspective, it's very helpful to get that infrastructure in place in the cloud and, and that shared data lake, which is more than just storage, right? So, I mean, there is a, a nice part of the fact that um, cloud technology and, and the advances in kind of um, in computing has made kind of raw storage very cheap, right? So we can hold on to a lot more data than we used to. Um, but there's still lots of challenges back to the, um, the, the, the carbon over silicon uh, comment, which I love. Um, is the, there's a lot of work to get that properly engineered and stored in a way that people can get access to it, to have um, kind of a tiering of that data so that you're storing the most uh, time uh, sensitive data that you need to get at right away in environments where you can get to it quickly versus other ones where you can maybe have more of a cold storage kind of setup. So all of that design and engineering needs to be done. And that's um, a lot of work that uh, we've been part of in the intelligence community and, and it's been going forward, moving forward really well to enable that development and design of 
um, machine learning algorithms and, and AI is to get all that data co-located, have a really good description and data catalog of what that data is and what's available and how to interact with it, have data services that can translate the data as needed from one uh, format to another so that you can bring in your data scientists and mission experts, uh, uh, AI, ML engineers to really start working right away to have impact. You know, I, I've read some studies that suggest um, on, a, on, you know, when you start up right away and try to do an, an AI ML type project, you know, your, your engineers, your, your, your high paid PhDs, you know, these brilliant people, um, even though I was a Marine with a PhD, it's always exciting. Um, I was in the Marine Corps also, sorry. Um, and so the, uh, but you know, t they spend 90% of their, their time just uh, formulating data and getting it prepared and getting ready to work on the algorithms. If you can do all that infrastructure, have that in place, they can really focus their energy on that hard problem that they're solving or that, that particular algorithm to get the impacts that are needed. Brian, your thoughts on that as far as the, um, the cloud and the culture shift required, because I know the IC is not going to like having their data somewhere where they can't see it and hold it. Right. There's a lot of issues to be resolved. Um, the IC likes to still pipe their data. They don't like to share. Uh, there's good reasons for that. There's bad reasons for that. Uh, even, even with um, our, our contractor base. Right. I think we had a lot of uh, interesting AI programs that got built up organically. Um, they all had their own mission engineering that was done, their own uh, data engineering that was done. So they, they built up uh, their own stovepipes. They put their applications on top of the stovepipes, which is fine, except nobody else can use their data. So now the data is locked up. What we'd like to do is free up the data um, because there's a lot of cost in data and the data engineering, the data management. And, and like Josh said, uh, provide an environment where uh, we could bring in a, uh, a, a data science team to come in and they can immediately start working on the problem because the data is already accessible. The data security stuff has already been worked out. They can just log in and start working and save six months on a program. Jimmy, uh, you uh, in NASA, you have to integrate uh, across a lot of different um, uh, things. You've got your ground systems have to speak to other ground systems. You have to speak to international partners. You have to speak to your commercial partners. You've got to speak to the general public. So how are you thinking about horizontal integration of your ground systems? Well, it's, it's really huge today that what we have to do. And so the technology we need to do that is, is key. The, and, and, and looking forward to the Artemis campaign, that even grows exponentially. We're going to have more commercial partners, more international partners, or, the, or a lot, many of the same that we have today, and how we share that data and integrate data and our systems together. And then the, and also, too, we have to protect their data, right? There's proprietary data there, and, and we're very uh, sensitive to that at, at NASA at Johnson Space Center about making sure that we only share the data that's supposed to get shared and uh, don't share the data that can't be. And so it's a very difficult problem uh, across the board. So many of our systems are designed to do that. But I, I, I admit that a lot of times today, it's kind of a brute force method. The way we do that today, where we, we have certain access to certain systems and then we cut off. And then a lot of that is, is managed through our, our, uh, our distributive architecture and our, uh, where folks can um, get access to the MCC systems through, through VPNs how they log in, but then when they log in, all that is managed internally to the system. So as we grow partners, that, be, that problem becomes greater, and that horizontal integration is, is always a difficult challenge. And as we bring on new partners and new companies, and at times when some companies, when the NASA mission isn't there, if there's not astronauts going or coming back from the moon or on the, you know, on the surface, there are ideas for commercial partners to actually operate certain things how do then we maintain those systems so the right people have the right access to the data that they need? And then once again, very difficult problem protecting the data that we can't share. So it, it is a continual a battle and, and there could be some AI systems in the future that help manage all that. Say you can see this, you can't see this, but uh, we're, we're just not there yet. Josh, what are the solutions to some of those issues then? So, I mean, it's a great point. The, um, we were talking about, we, I've been talking a little bit about AI and ML and, and some of those infrastructure things about how to enable the mission, but there also can be turned inward to kind of help make sure the system is resilient and secure. Um, and so there's lots of opportunity to use 
AI ML in kind of a zero trust architecture environment so that you're collecting all that log data and all that and, and you have a good um, security uh, architecture in place to keep track of who's accessing what because lots of these problems in the space domain are multi-domain. So there, there's aspects on the commercial and we talk about commercial integration on the, even in the DoD and IC, but also when you look at like space traffic management as a problem, even though we're not the SDA panel, right? There, there's, it's a multi-domain issue where there's lots of commercial providers, there's lots of people in space who aren't part of the defense or Intel or, or part of the adversary you know, environment. So all that data needs to be shared. And so having an approach that can quickly discern you know, bad actors and, 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 and bad behavior that might be happening in the system or, or just faults and, and things like that uh, in order to design the system for more resiliency uh, helps a lot. And then uh, and on the cyber piece as well uh, to help uh, you know, keep track of those same things. But I think the, the big one around the AI is predicting faults and looking at that. Uh, so getting all that data together and uh, that openness of your architecture enables that as well to get that data shared. And we will start taking uh, questions from the audience and from our uh, virtual audience as well. So you can start getting that uh, ready as we um, start wrapping up. Your, your thoughts, Brian, on cybersecurity. Yeah, I think AI can play a large role in cybersecurity um, and, and making the, the, uh, the ground systems and the, the entire architecture, frankly, uh, more resilient. I think Josh already mentioned uh, what AI can do on the problem detection side. Right. They can look for anomalies to, in your systems. They can look for unusual behaviors of your users and systems on your network. Uh, they can um, integrate cyber intelligence into the framework because if you see something going on somewhere else in the world, you can start taking the protective measures on your own network to protect against that uh, potential threat. I think once you've identified the, uh, a problem or that you've um, experienced a, uh, an attack, uh, you can automatically take, uh, allocate your resources, your compute resources uh, to isolate where that problem is and to protect the rest of your network and to make sure that you can continue on with your mission. Um, and at the same time, of, uh, as you're isolating that attack, you can automatically deploy kind of temporary protective measures uh, before you call the security teams to do the, the actual research. Um, Brian, from your perspective, where is the IC on that spectrum from human on the loop um, from human in the loop to human on the loop. Right, they're still very uh, anchored and human in the loop. Um, Why is that? Is it just because they don't trust computers or? Uh, no, I, I, think, I think the real reason is uh, uh, not that they don't trust computers, but not that they trust computers, but the architecture really hasn't changed much for the last several decades. So they have these processes that have worked and they see no reason to change those processes because they, they've been working fine. Why do you want to accept some technical risk associated with changing um, when you don't have to? I don't think that that works in the, the era of proliferated LEO architectures uh, like SDA is proposing. I'll point back to um, what SDA is doing because they um, publicly acknowledge these things. Um, right At that time, the, uh, the temporal sampling rates are much higher uh, than what you're experiencing today with the, uh, the less proliferated architectures. Um, it gives you less time to identify objects of interest uh, or activities of interest. It gives you less time to uh, task the, the next uh, opportunity uh, to do a collection in order to maintain contact or custody of that particular object and, and just to make sure you know what's going on. So I think that the more satellites you get in orbit, uh, the, the less time you have to react and you're gonna have to be forced into automation in order to really take effective use of, of the assets that you have in orbit. And Mimi, if I could just add there, you know, cyber threats are, are a daily and, and growing threat in, in, in our world as well. And, just using AI, as like, like these two gentlemen described, to, to kind of be that, that, that front wall. We, we've looked at maybe could you use some of the AI to, to monitor our firewalls that we use to protect data in the Mission Control Center to, to look for those threats. The other comment I would add to that, too, is that uh, we have to be worried, too, that bad actors could use AI on the other end, that they could start using AI as a, the, the threat initiator to, to try to break into those things. So we may have to fight fire with fire in, in that regard. So Jimmy, what's, if cost wasn't such a driver for you, what, what's the art of the possible? What, if you could just dream, what would it be? Oh, wow, I'm gonna get in trouble here. <laughs> but the, uh, uh, I, think, I think a system that takes minimal number of, of people to, to sustain, um, 
you know, if we could have a reliable AI system, like I'll just use the example of cyber threats. If we have a reliable AI system that is our, our, our front line of defense for cyber threats, then the number of people that we have deployed doing that today can go down and that saves us money. So that, that's a dream world. The, uh, you know, um, you know, onboard uh, monitoring systems or ground monitoring systems to look for, you know, um, you know, leak detection on board our spacecrafts or, 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 you know, planning the next three months of, of the mission, you know, continuous ISS operations, the planning and then replanning. Uh, you know, a lot of times we're planning for a launch and it's bad weather. There's not really anything we can do about what, what let's say I could take care of weather for us. I don't think so. But there's nothing we can do about weather. So now a launch slips three, four, five days and now you constantly replanning. If you had a system that could replan things like that with minimum number of humans involved, at the end of the day, that's going to save me a lot of money, which is the, the my dream goal. <laughs> that is your dream. <laughs> okay, well, we'll take uh, questions from the audience and uh, from uh, our friends virtually as well, if there's anybody that wants to ask a question. Anybody, anything come in? Uh, from uh, virtual? So, looking forward a little bit here, right? We do beam stuff down to the ground, do the processing here, ground control down here. That's heavily data intensive, bandwidth intensive. That's not always possible. Is there any notions in any of y'all's communities of taking that and moving some of the ground stations functions to the edge and using it in the space as opposed to on the ground. Is that, what's the roadmap that looks like? So, I mean, I'll, I'll start. I mean, I, I really resonated with um, what Dr. Schmansky was saying about, you know, the, I think at this point, the use cases are fairly limited of what makes sense to push to the edge because the, the swap is so constrained on up in space. Um, I do think that as we can train algorithms and train, uh, especially around either, you know, image detection and, and um, you know, for software defined radios and things like that, that you can push some of those things to the edge. There's a value uh, to that. And I think that's some of those things also is and, uh, the other example I thought you gave, which is a good one, which is you know, similar to how we think sometimes about, um, you know, UASs and things that work in, in concert, having communication and some of the things that uh, Space Development Agency is doing around. This idea of the proliferate architecture, where it's almost like a swarm, where there's cross-link communications, and they and they do stuff in that way. Um, those, those seem like good approaches, but I do think a lot of work has to be done still on getting the compute improved um, in space, and because there's been a real shift to smaller and cheaper satellites, so that's not helping uh, really drive up the compute capability. But as you know, Moore's law continues, we should see better and better. Uh, computing that, that gets smaller and lighter that we can get up there. And as launch costs go down, we've already seen that, right? That'll get us the ability to get heavier things uh, into space more regularly. So I, I do think it's it's coming, but it's a little farther out because of those constraints, in, in my opinion. Yeah, when I see stuff like those requirements show up on SBIRs and STTDRs, it, to me, that suggests that the technology is still very immature and it's, it's quite a long way out. I think maybe the, the stuff that you're seeing on the commercial group, uh, there's always questions on on, on flying commercial hardware in orbit and it's not space qualified and how long will it last and there's been arguments one way or the other if it's um, but I think with the military and the IC seem to put a lot of stock in space qualified you'll probably see a lot less of that um, reliance on the commercial side they're more willing to take the risk and just put a computer on a bus and, and launch it to see what happens so if that works in 2025 you can see an acceleration of of more and more of the uh, the ground compute uh, moving up into orbit. We have a question in uh, from online. Question from our virtual audience. Understanding that AI uses large language models, has any research been done into the use of large action models to execute on human intentions before a command request is input? Anybody know what that means? <laughs> I think I follow the logic of the question, but I don't know of anything around the large action. I've never, that might be a new term. I've never heard That's that. That's a new term for me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, no, but I think it, it is, I mean, the, you know, maybe stepping back from the wording to the intent, the idea that using AI ML to more predict 
what people are going to do. I mean, that's definitely something um, that a lot of work is, is being done around or, or research and thinking around. Um, you know, we've, we've done some work around Bayesian belief models, and, 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 but it takes a lot of, um, I think what Dr. Shinsky referenced to, uh, kind of a priori knowledge from analysts of how people have behaved in the past and what they're likely to do, kind of being kind of put into those models. It's hard to do that with the machine learning models um, because we don't have a lot of data collected on actions from from people. Yeah, I would I would um, if I was looking for this, I would look to the medical community. I know that there's some work being done uh, for people with Alzheimer's that they tend to get agitated and then have violent outbursts. And there's uh, using looking at ways to uh, use AI to predict when these outbursts were going to occur, so you can start taking um, kind of corrective action to calm the person back down. So. Uh, if, if there is work being done in this area, it's probably first being done in the medical community. And then uh, once it shows promise, I suspect it would, it would be moved over to the IC, much like computer vision. So. Go ahead. Yes, my uh, question is generated uh, around the workforce. Uh, so uh, Jimmy, from a NASA perspective, and Dr. Brian, from an uh, intelligence community perspective, uh, Jimmy, your missions are maybe to use AI and data to, to protect the humans going up. Uh, Dr. Brian, your data is uh, going to be used to protect the, uh, the humans who are doing missions here on the ground. Uh, but I want to ask you a question about the humans supporting the mission. Um, what is the evolution of those people uh, that are in the background, right? You know, in the back rooms and uh, uh, supporting the missions. Because uh, we ha have a lot of talk about, you know, how that will enable, you know, both human space flight and then the intelligence operators. But talk to me a little bit about what you see in the future of the evolution of the humans supporting your missions. Uh, for um, for my area, human space flight, we um, we want to be able to automate things so that uh, we can have fewer people in those back rooms at times and. Uh, but to but in order to do that, AI has to be reliable. I, I can't stress that enough. It has to be reliable. And there's not a lot of trust in, in my community right now, and I would say in the human spaceflight community of those systems where I would, you know, take a you know, room of people today and then make it half a room or even a quarter of a room, right? So um, the the eyes on the data, the eyes monitoring the system, it's gonna be very I think it's going to be a tough stretch, but we're going to have to prove ourselves along the way. And, and I think we can do that because I've already seen in my time in the, in the human spaceflight world the evolution of those systems and that, you know, the tools we have today for our, our flight controllers on console to monitor the spacecraft are much more than when I started there and I, I was sitting monitoring a, a space shuttle. A uh, more, lot more automation a lot more long-term leak detection, things like that, that definitely tell the, the, the human, you, this is what's going on with your spacecraft. The, the thing I think I struggle with, and maybe my community does, is we're the ones through that experience or through just the learning of, of, of just flying missions, we're the, lear we're the ones who were able to put together those tools and those algorithms and teach the machine to do that. And if I stop doing that because I get to a certain port, how do I do that in the future? So I'm always going to have to have somebody there that understands how to operate a spacecraft system to think about every failure that can happen. We do that all the time. It's like we, a lot of times our engineering counterparts will say, you, all, you guys always think this will fail and this will fail and this, you stack failures. But on a... But we have seen things in human spaceflight that, you know, that surprised us. A system we thought would never freeze up, happened to me, uh, <laughs> on a space shuttle mission, froze. You know, three redundant computers, oh, they'll never go down at the same time. It happened on ISS early in the program. I think it was a 6A where we lost three of the main MDMs. They all went down. We had a backup system that, that saved that day. Uh, there were those who said, you don't need a backup system because you have three. Net three will never fail. So those are the kinds of things that I've just learned over my career that, you know, we always think about what is the worst thing that can happen. And then we train ourselves to do that. And what, in, in recent years, we put that, no kidding, maybe paranoia <laughs> of, 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 of spacecraft failures. 
we put that into our, our automated tools. So for me, the future of that is if, will I ever be smart enough that I will just put all that in a tool and walk away? I don't know. We don't trust it today. <laughs> yeah, when I was- Another, in, oh, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, when I was in I2 school, we started doing some things a little bit differently. Um, I would be getting these Air Force officers who had master's degrees in data science from Stanford or PhDs from MIT or UVA. And, and our instinct was to turn them into program managers and co tars uh, to run contracts. And instead of doing that, we thought, well, why don't we see if we can actually have these guys use their skills? Because they're the smartest guys we had. And, they're, and coming just out of school, um, they may have been smarter than the guys in industry. Uh, whose degrees might be getting a little bit stale. Uh, so we started building environments that they could uh, actually code tools within i 2 spo And actually, I think it was, it was being pretty successful. We'll see if it works on long term when they actually have to maintain tools. But we looked at stuff that the Air Force was doing with Kobayashi Maru and Kessel Run, and it seemed very promising. My thought was always that the, the guy who best knows the problem and how to solve the problem are, are the, the people, uh, I'll generalize it, um, the people who are closest uh, to the problem, uh, the analysts are on the edge uh, who see the problem every day. They know best how to solve the problem. And we wanted to push the AI all the way out to them, the data scientists out to them. To, so the guys closest to the edge are the ones who are actually writing code and solving the problem, and which, which brings more uh, problems. But I think that we'll just have to encounter those problems over time. If we really want to scale, AI and ML, I think it's good enough to use right now. We just need to start doing it. And it'll, and it'll continue to improve over time. Another question from virtual? Yes, could you please summarize in a single sentence what your expectations are for the integration of AI and space 10 years into the future? Oh Lord, one <laughs> sentence guys. Um. You can't ask a, you can't ask a professor to do one sentence. <laughs> Don't ask Brian. <laughs> It'll be a long sentence. Okay. <laughs> it will be expensive. Um, I I I think a lot depends. You're you're waiting for that next big hurdle and something to be proven, right? That you could actually have the compute power that'll fly, and you have uh, and you'll be able to get the communication amongst the satellite swarms that they can communicate with with one another and do distributed processing. Um, it, it could be within within five years, uh, and we'll be able to realize that vision. Five years to actually have confidence in the tools, and then another three to five years to actually build a satellite in, that, that operates in this manner. Um, so in 10 years, maybe we'll, we'll be there uh, with, with a kind of a very limited uh, capability in orbit, or, or it might never happen because we just can't get the compute power. Okay, I'll try one sentence. Reliable AI to help enable, execute, and protect the human spaceflight mission at a lower cost. Wow. wow. Yeah. <laughs> that was one sentence. Josh, wrap things up for us. What's, what's at stake here um, to get this right? Sure. Um, yeah, I think there's, I mean, all the things we're talking about, there's so much promise, I think, in the technology and, and where we're going. I, I think there's um, sort of three things that I think we should sort of walk away with. Uh, you know, is one is that we need to make sure that our ground systems are constantly using the latest technology and and sort of uh, development paradigms in order to keep them moving fast to keep the, that we can attract the right talent um, into the uh, into the mission space to work on them. Um, all those things I think are, are really important on that level. Second, I think we need to continue to design those systems to be open and flexible um, and and as low as less proprietary as possible in order to inject new technology quickly to have the flexibility to move them around. Um, because, you know, you would joke like two, three years ago, nobody was talking about large language models, right? I mean, that, that would kind of blew up out of nowhere. And so there's, you know, to try to guess like 10 years, for example, on the last one is really hard. Two years from now, there, there could be a brand new topic, you know, it'd be something, you know, space plus whatever, you know, that we're talking about here because the technology moves so quickly. So we need to really design for that openness and flexibility in our systems. And then I think the, the, the other thing that kind of resonated for me in, in the discussion today is partnerships. I mean, there's a lot between industry, government, commercial, academia, as all these things are moving forward and everyone's thinking about, you know, and, and you know, we've seen this in space, the democratization, so many more people are involved than used to be that there's just a greater diversity of thinking and more opportunity to kind of pull in different thoughts. 
Uh, so I think we need to keep focused on that going forward to, to make this all happen. All right, gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us here. Thank you. Thanks.